No word on the exams yet, unfortunately. Um, let you know as soon as I know. Um, moving through transcription, and um, I should also say that what I'm talking about here really has not so much to do with transcription other than in very general terms. Uh, a lot of structural things here and so forth. Uh, as I noted, I will have a, a couple of lectures I will give on gene expression, uh, which will encompass more of the sort of transcriptional machinery and how things actually operate. And question over here. Would I be open to you getting your note card before dead week? Um, I don't know. What, is there a reason you need it uh, too soon? It'd take about an hour to put it together. <laughs> okay. Well, here's what I would say. Um, it's going to be a five by eight note card. It'd be a five by eight note card. So if you want to start laying it out, go get a five by eight note card and do that. And then all really you have to do is just copy it over. Um, so I would just as soon wait until dead week to actually do that. So, uh, but just get a five by eight and just lay it out. Okay. All right. Um, so last time I started talking about um, messenger RNAs in eukaryotic cells, and I pointed out that messenger RNAs uh, in eukaryotic cells were uh, processed, and I uh, showed this figure that had the um, the cap that is a feature of eukaryotic but not prokaryotic messenger RNAs. And I made the case that one of the reasons this happens is it gives some stability to the um, uh, messenger RNA against RNAs nuclease uh, degradation. And um, I summarized those three things that I talked about last time with respect to the functions of the cap uh, in class. I won't re repeat those here, other than, uh, although you obviously can see them. And I want to say, um, uh, another thing about uh, eukaryotic messenger RNAs that's important. I mentioned it very briefly last time, and that's a, a phenomenon known as polyadenylation. So eukaryotic messenger RNAs and some prokaryotic messenger RNAs, although this is much more common in eukaryotes, um, get uh, what's called a, a poly-A tail that is added to the three prime end of the messenger RNA. And this happens as a result of uh, the transcriptional machinery uh, recognizing a sequence um, that goes AAUAAA. -A -A -A. And so when that sequence appears in a um, messenger RNA, it's a signal to the transcriptional machinery to start doing what's called polyadenylation. And polyadenylation involves the attachment of hundreds of A's to the three prime end of that messenger RNA. So remember the five prime end's got the cap the three prime end gets this poly A tail. And so why does that poly A tail go on there? And in the case of eukaryotic messenger RNAs, it appears to give uh, more stability to the messenger RNA, kind of like the cap does. So <clears throat> it has been shown that the longer the poly A tail is, the longer the messenger RNA hangs around. <clears throat> and this is probably, uh, again, a protection against nuclease degradation. So um, there's the poly A noted right there. The nucleases that work that are RNases tend to be exonucleases, meaning they start on the outside and move inwards. Well, nucleases at the five prime end are protected uh, against degradation almost completely by the cap, at least the exonucleases are. And at the three prime end, the poly A tail does not stop a nuclease from functioning. Rather, what it does is it's kind of like that telomere on the end of a linear um, chromosome. The longer that telomere is, the longer that um, it is until good sequences get chewed up by the replication process. And the same thing happens here. A nuclease comes on that chews away four or five bases, uh, and there's a couple hundred bases to get through means that it will take longer for nucleases to cleave that messenger RNA and break it down to the point where it's no longer functional. So the size of the poly A tail at the three prime end probably is important for that uh, purpose. There are other things that happen to um, eukaryotic uh, messenger RNAs and to other RNAs, not just, eukaryotic, not, not just messenger RNAs, but they're all eukaryotic. And that's a phenomenon you've heard about before called splicing. 
<clears throat> so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the splicing phenomenon, why it's important, why it happens, uh, and so forth. I, I don't have all the answers to that because we don't know all the answers to that, but we do know some of them. Splicing occurs when a sequence internal, or a sequence or sequences, usually there's more than one, internal to, a, uh, to an RNA, and as I, note as I said, it doesn't have to be just a messenger RNA, but sequences internal to an RNA are removed and the ends that corresponded to the sequence that were removed are joined together. And so we can actually see this here going on in this, uh, trans in this processing that's occurring on this messenger RNA. This processing involves the removal of sequences called introns, which are shown here in green, and the joining of the pieces that are on either side of where that intron was, and those sequences that are remaining are called exons. So you have introns and exons, Exon, uh, introns being the portions that get removed, exons being the portions that remain. And um, a mature messenger, or in this case a messenger RNA, a mature messenger RNA will have several features then. It'll have a five prime cap. It will have a three prime, what's called UTR, okay? And that's an untranslated region. That is a, a, a stretch of up to a couple hundred uh, uh, nucleotides where uh, it is not translated. That then intersects with a region that is translated, which corresponds to exons, and we see several exons that are here. And though this is shown with gaps in between there, these are all joined together in one contiguous piece. So they're not separate pieces. We're just showing where the pieces came from with those gaps that are there. The, the next feature that we'll <clears throat> find in a uh, eukaryotic messenger RNA uh, will be a three prime untranslated region, which will again be a sequence that doesn't code for protein, but that could be up to several hundred uh, nucleotides long. And then that's followed, of course, by the poly A tail. Now, several of these features, including the poly A tail and the um, cap, as well as the untranslated regions, may have roles in the process of translation that I'll be talking about later. And I'll show you specifically how the cap and the uh, three prime uh, poly, a poly A tail play a role in translation. So why, uh, and, and this phenomenon I've just described to you about uh, splicing, which is what it's called, why does splicing occur? And you should note that splicing does not occur in prokaryotic cells, okay? Splicing only occurs in eukaryotic cells. There are uh, two very, very minor exceptions uh, to that in prokaryotic cells, and we treat them as if they don't really exist because they occur in viruses. And, uh, we don't discuss them as being prokaryotic. So all splicing that occurs, occurs in eukaryotic cells. And it occurs within a structure we know as a spliceosome. So there's a structure that performs the splicing function that I'm going to show you. It's called a spliceosome. So it occurs only in eukaryotic cells, which means that in eukaryotic cells, gene coding regions are in pieces. In prokaryotic cells, gene coding pieces are one contiguous thing. They're not put together as pieces. Well, if you think about putting things together as pieces, and you remember that a genetic code specifies each amino acid, if you screw up putting the pieces together by one nucleotide, for example, you screw up the translation of that entire message. So the precision of the splicing process is critical. It's critical, all right? Screwing up splicing will ruin a messenger RNA and uh, have other problems. And again, I note that other RNAs are spliced as well. I keep, most, most commonly we talk about messenger RNAs, but ribosomal RNAs and some transfer RNAs are also spliced. Well, let's look at the splicing uh, process. I'm gonna do this in very general terms. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details uh, of the splicing. Um, you can see more of that process happening right here, and it shows you again in each case where e each exon ends up. You'll notice that, that we don't see shuffling. People talk about shuffling of exons. We don't see shuffling in the sense that blue comes before green. Blue will always be before green down here. Green comes before red. red green will always be before red. We won't see another messenger RNA that'll have red before green, so we don't swap sequences, for example. 
okay? When people talk about shuffling of exons, they're typically talking about over evolutionary time. And over evolutionary time, that simply means that the exons get rearranged in the genome in different ways. Why do cells have, or why do eukaryotic cells have these? We think they have them because it actually facilitates the evolutionary process. It facilitates the evolution and development of proteins. In many cases, we see in exons, the regions that are coded correspond to functional domains of proteins. So for example, a lot of proteins bind ATP and use ATP as an energy source. A lot of proteins use the same general sequence to do that, and over evolutionary time, all they have to do is duplicate that sequence and then shuffle it through the genome to various places where that could be used. So exons, from an evolutionary standpoint, are very, very advantageous for an organism. Very advantageous. But again, we have to be thinking in evolutionary time. Not the time of one cell, two cells, but hundreds, thousands of generations of cells, during which time there can be uh, moving and mi mixing of sequences. And as that happens, then there can be selection to favor those that are advantageous moves and mixes that happen and give rise to what we see, <clears throat> excuse me, as the mature proteins today. Okay, so that's one uh, consideration that we have for splicing. When we look at the uh, splicing uh, phenomenon, okay, we notice a couple of things. And so I'm going to show you here, this is about as much molecular detail as I'm going to go into, but I will um, give you a little bit of detail here. Splicing occurs in a structure called a spliceosome. And a spliceosome contains protein. It also contains some small RNAs. And those small RNAs all have the letter U in front of them. Okay? U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, U6. Okay? They all have a U in front of them. And those small RNAs help to orient the splicing machinery, the spliceosome that is, to perform its function. Now I've told you that the precision with which this occurs is critical. If it misses off by one base, then it makes a messenger RNA that's not going to be functional. Okay? What the spliceosome does is it facilitates the reaction that you see on the screen. I'll show you the assembly of the spliceosome in a minute, but we're not going to pay much attention to the detail of that. But this we will, because here is the critical features of what happens in splicing. The intron in this case is the line that's in the middle, and you can see some sequences that are listed there. You see on the far left side, which corresponds to the five prime end of the intron, you see the sequence GU. And at the other end, you see at the three prime end of the intron, the sequence AG. And virtually every intron that is spliced in eukaryotic cells has that structure. A GU at the five prime end, and an AG at the three prime end. Now, there are many GUs that occur that are not spliced, and there are many AGs that occur that are not spliced. Okay? So understanding which GUs are chosen and which AGs are chosen is an area of a lot of interest. Okay? Because we, otherwise we would see every time we had a GU and an AG, we would see a splice, and that doesn't occur every time. The third feature we see of the intron is a sequence near the three prime end. It's usually within about 20 or 30 nucleotides of the three prime end. That's pyrimidine rich. Very pyrimidine rich, except for in the middle of it, there's an A. Okay? It's pyrimidine rich, but in the middle of it, there's an A. And that A plays a role in the splicing process. The transcriptional machinery, I'm sorry, the, the spliceosome sets up so that that A is brought into very close proximity of the G that's at the five prime end of the intron. 
There is a nucleophilic attack that the A makes on that G. And the result of that is that a covalent bond is formed between the A and the G. You can see that covalent bond right here. Okay? This covalent bond is an unusual one. It's a bond okay, between the 5 prime end all right, of the uh, G and the 2 prime hydroxyl of the A. So it's a 5 prime to 2 prime bond. Okay? This is the only place we see a 5 prime to 2 prime bond. In the cap, we saw a 5 prime to 5 prime bond. That was the only place we saw that. Here we see a 5 prime to 2 prime bond, and that's the only place that we see that. Okay? The next step in the process involves the 3 prime end of the, ex of the, of the exon being joined to the 5 prime end of the next exon. So the 3 prime end of this one to the 5 prime end of this one, and the result of that is a splitting out of the intron. This is all catalyzed in the spliceosome. Everything you see here is occurring in the spliceosome. Okay? Now, the intron is excised and left out in the form of what we call a lariat structure because it looks a little bit like a lariat. Okay? Notice that it has a free 3 prime end. It does not have a free 5 prime end because the 5 prime end has been joined to the 2 prime hydroxyl of that A. Now, if we look at um, uh, this process in detail, which I'm not going to hold you responsible for what's on the screen. I'm going to talk through it very briefly, and you're not going to be responsible for what I'm talking about here. Okay? I just want you to see what's happening. All right. There are various proteins and various RNAs that all have this U designation that come together. Okay? So this is the formation or the, the, the actual building of the spliceosome. Each time a spliceosome functions, it has to be built. And those small RNAs that I described to you, some of them are complementary to portions of the intron. So it's those RNAs that are, in fact, helping to align where these individual bases need to be so that these nucleophilic attacks that I described to you can occur. And that's facilitated not only by the small RNAs, but also by the proteins that they are associated with. Okay? Was that easy enough? Everybody's tired. Okay. The result is you have a spliced RNA as a result of all of that action. Well, why is this important? I told you one reason that we think splicing is important is because it uh, facilitates the evolution and development of new proteins. There's another very important and very, it's very clear advantage of splicing. And that is a, a phenomenon known as alternative splicing. Okay, so I'm going to describe to you what alternative splicing is. Alternative splicing means, as its name suggests, that certain splicing actions result in the production of different messenger RNAs. For example, let's look over here for, here's the same sequence made into DNA. There's the coding of the DNA, there's where the, where the exons, there's where the introns are in between there. And we can see we have one, two, three, four, five uh, exons that would appear in the mature RNA if they all appeared. And this is where RNA uh, alternative splicing comes into play. They don't all necessarily appear in the final version. In this case, we see on the left, the messenger RNA has got all five. And we can see that if that's translated, it might give a protein that looks something like this. Alternatively, this might be spliced so that the splicing, instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, joins the 3 prime end of exon 2 to the 5 prime end of exon 4. When that happens, exon 3 is lost. And so the messenger RNA that's produced by that is 1, 2, 4, 5. 
Again, we haven't shuffled back and forth because two is still coming before four, but we've left three out. Okay? So alternative splicing gives many more possibilities of making different proteins using the same DNA sequence. The third possibility here involves removal of exon 4. So we see 1, 2, 3, followed by 5. Well, as you might expect, if you make proteins that have different structures that lack certain domains or that contain other domains, then each of those proteins that's made can have a very different and specific function. When we first sequenced the human genome, people were amazed at how few unique coding protein sequences there were. About 25,000 or so. Okay? If we look at flies, or, or even E. coli, E. coli, a single cell bacterium, okay, has three or 4,000 genes. We weren't nearly as much more complicated as we thought we were compared to these simple organisms that had, you know, some f significant fraction of the number of genes that we have. Well, one of the things that happens is that even though we have about 25,000 or so unique genes, the alternative ways in which they're spliced result in production of well over 100,000 different proteins. Okay? So alternative splicing allows the same sequence to produce a, a large number of separate proteins. Alternative splicing, how and when does it occur? Usually we see alternative splicing changing with differentiation of cells. A bone cell may splice a given gene in one way and a muscle cell may splice that same gene in a different way. Or one type of muscle cell might splice the same muscle related gene differently than, let's say, uh, an intestinal muscle cell compared to a skeletal muscle cell, okay? So these differentiated cells will commonly have different ways of splicing a given messenger RNA. Okay, um, I've mentioned polyadenylation, and polyadenylation can also um, have alternatives. This shows alternative polyadenylation, okay? which is um, giving rise to different uh, messenger RNAs depending upon how the poly A itself gets attached. And again, it's the same net result that we end up with different exons that end up being translated depending upon how the polyadenylation actually occurs. I'm sorry? Oh, how does alternative poly, I'm sorry, I should have said a little bit more about that. So, alternative polyadenylation occurs. You can see that there's, if this, if this were the uh, original messenger RNA that were made, okay, then this poly A site could be, be attached in different ways. The splicing could play a role in how this was put together to make this, or the poly A could be put onto a, an exon as it's being made. So, depending upon where the transcriptional machinery sees the signal for the, the uh, poly A determines how that poly A gets on. Alternative splicing is more common than alternative polyadenylation, but alternative polyadenylation can also play a role. Okay? Okay. Um, zipping right through things here. Um, let's see. Oh, RNA editing. As if there wasn't enough complexity from having caps and polyadenylation and splicing, there's also a phenomenon known as RNA editing. And RNA editing occurs in almost every cell, or at least I should say almost every cell, in almost every organism, including humans. Some organisms it happens abundantly in. In humans, there's only a handful of genes that are alternatively, that are, that are edited by RNA editing. I want to show you how it occurs, but I'll also tell you that some organisms like trypanosomes have thousands of sequences that are edited. Well, what does editing mean? Editing means that after a messenger RNA, or after an RNA has been made, this occurs pretty much only to messenger RNA, 
after a messenger RNA has been made, a chemical alteration of the bases in that messenger RNA changes them. Okay? It changes them. So, how does that happen? That's actually kind of complicated, and I won't uh, go into that, but you can see here, um, here is a, um, uh, uh, a sequence, let's see, how do I want to say this? Here's a sequence that has been made um, to give a, a, a pre-edited messenger RNA. And, uh, let's see, what do I want to say? You can see the change of the sequence. So here's, here's an AA that becomes a UU, all right? Um, and actually, that, I'm sorry, that is the guide RNA. This, this is a little confusing because the guide RNA is on, it's, it's base paired and I haven't shown the base pairing. Let me just describe the process since I don't have a good figure here showing you. So you have a messenger RNA that's got a, a given sequence. And the cell wants to edit that sequence. But if it wants to edit that sequence, it needs to know which bases do I need to change? So the way it changes them is it synthesizes a complementary RNA to that sequence that it wants to change. And that complementary RNA has mismatches at the place where the sequence should change. Then there are proteins that come in and read the guide RNA and change the sequence in the messenger RNA so that they become perfectly complementary. That's how RNA editing is occurring. Okay? So the guide RNA plays a very critical role in telling the RNA editing machinery where the changes should occur and what those changes should be. RNA editing, as I said, occurs in almost every organism. We have, um, and we, in our cells, we have uh, alternative, alter I'm sure you'd say alternative splicing, but alternative editing that give rise to the proteins involved in chylomicrons compared to LDLs. And the same protein is used, okay, the same sequence is used, but change of one base changes it from being a long protein to being a shorter protein. And that's the effect that RNA editing can have because the genetic code, of course, is read in three base sequences. And if you change, let's say, um, a UAC to a UAG, UAG is a stop codon. And so you change the sequence so that instead of being a long protein, it becomes a short protein. That's one thing that can happen as a result of RNA editing. There are other more subtle things that can happen, like the change of one amino acid to another. Okay? So RNA editing is yet another way in which eukaryotic messenger RNAs can be altered. Okay. That, oh, that's what I just did, yes. Okay, um, let's take a break for a verse. This is a verse that my wife Indira wrote. That um, I, it's in our, it's in your book. I, I like it. I want to read it through for you. Paul II is so smart. Now let me see. It makes a transcript. One, two, three. From a billion base pairs, can it find the one promoter it must bind? I need some help. I hear it plead. This DNA I cannot read. I cannot see where I must start till TF2s have done their part. When Tata's bound by TBP, that sends a signal out, you see. Once DNA has made a bend, more TF2s will soon attend. When Bs arrive, it clears a place for RNA polymerase, and F and E soon join the fun, TF, uh, TF2H, the final one. The last one is a special case that moonlights as a helicase and sends a Paul II upon its way to make a brand new RNA. How does it do that, you may ask, a phosphate does the crucial task. Added on to CTD, that's how the H sets Paul II free. And Paul II goes its merry way, there soon will be some RNA. Then introns must all be excised as RNA is capped and spliced. Then poly A polymerase will add a couple hundred A's. For my own transcript, I can say that all I want is one more A. You might want that for your grade, for example. Okay. Um, I mentioned briefly um, other RNAs and the fact that they get altered. And uh, what I'm going to show you next um, is a schematic representation of transfer RNAs. 
Transfer RNAs are the most universally altered RNA. They're, they're altered uh, significantly in prokaryotes, and they're altered significantly in eukaryotes, and we still don't completely understand the significance of the chemical alterations that happen to them. But virtually all tRNAs are, excuse me, are chemically modified. They're all chemically modified. It may be so that they get flagged as tRNAs and the cell recognizes them as that. We don't really know, okay? When we look at a tRNA, we can see some of those modifications uh, that um, happen. There's methylation that's occurring uh, right there, okay? We can also see a loop out here called the pseudouridine loop where there's a, a modification to uridine that creates this base with this um, uh, phi symbol right here that is um, uh, common. And there are other modifications chemically that can happen uh, in those. When we look at tRNAs, we see a couple of things. One is that tRNAs, of course, have a five prime end and they have a three prime end. And we notice that the tRNA is one strand. It's not two things or three things put together, but it's one strand. And when we look at that, we see within there numerous stem loops, things like what we saw before. These stem loops arrange themselves, at least in a two-dimensional sense, to look something like what you see on the screen. In three dimensions, it actually looks somewhat different than that. But in two dimensions, if we lay it out, this is what it looks like. It forms what we call a cloverleaf structure. That cloverleaf structure is called that because you can see the end, one end of the cloverleaf there, the D loop, one end of the cloverleaf there, the anticodon loop, and one end of the cloverleaf there, the pseudouridine loop. And there's also usually a little leg or something that sticks off of it right between those two loops as you can see here. We're going to focus our attention on the anticodon loop as we talk about translation because it's the anticodon loop that carries the information that tells the translational machinery which amino acid it is carrying. The amino acid in a transfer RNA is carried through a covalent linkage on the five prime end of the tRNA. And you can see that the five prime end of the tRNA ends in the sequence CCA. That's how tRNA sequences terminate at the five prime, I'm sorry, at the, I should say five prime, at the three prime end, I keep saying five prime, sorry, at the three prime end. It's at the three prime end where the amino acids uh, carry, not the five prime end, sorry, I've got five prime in my head. Okay, so the three prime end is where the amino acid is covalently attached to the transfer RNA. The five prime end is recessed, as you can see here, and doesn't contain that CCA that is sticking off of the end, uh, as you can see up here. Um, those are general things. Now, all of these chemical modifications happen after the transfer RNA is made. There are enzymes that come in that do those modifications, and they appear to be critical for the function of a transfer RNA. Transfer RNAs, uh, at least in E. coli, are synthesized as part of bigger RNAs that are then processed. And that processing involves cutting various pieces of them off. In this case, you can see, uh, actually this is eukaryotic here, but you can see the um, um, ribosomal RNAs, which are labeled as 18S and 28S, that are attached as part of this much bigger sequence that contains other um, uh, RNAs in there. Okay, this one, I, I said transfer RNAs. This one actually ha only has ribosomal RNAs. When we look in prokaryotic cells, the ribosomal RNAs and the transfer RNAs are made on the same piece. And so there are enzymes that have to come along and cut out those things precisely so that the cell has transfer RNAs and ribosomal RNAs it can make. In eukaryotic cells, which I should have looked at that earlier, I apologize. In eukaryotic cells, the ribosomal RNAs are all grouped like this and they must also all be excised, okay? So both the transfer RNAs and the ribosomal RNAs are made as bigger pieces, and those bigger pieces are chopped up into smaller ones to derive the smaller functional units. I mentioned pseudouridine before, and no, you're not responsible for this, but since I mentioned it, I thought I would show you uh, the overall structure of that. The overall structure of pseudouridine involves basically flipping this ring so that the attachment becomes here instead of here. You can see one and five basically have switched uh, places by the flipping of that ring to do that. And that creates a pseudouridine. Why does the cell do that? We don't completely know. 
Oh, yeah. That's my feeling, too. All right. Um, the last thing I'll mention now are the ribosomal RNAs. And so the ribosomal RNAs are, uh, as their name suggests, uh, components of the ribosome. They're by far the biggest components of the ribosome. And they each have a specialized function. We're going to talk about a couple of those functions when I start talking about translation. Okay? In, pro in prokaryotes, we see three ribosomal RNAs. One that's called a 5S, one that's called a 16S, and one that's called a 23S. The S refers to Svedberg units, S-V-E-D-B-E-R-G. They're basically measures of size, but they're not linear measures of size. What does that mean? Well, it means that a 23S is bigger than a 16S, but it's not 1.5 times bigger, which is about what 23S is compared to 16S. It means that 16S is bigger than a 5S, but it's not three times bigger, it's just bigger. Okay? The Svedberg units came from measuring sizes by using a centrifuge, and it's for that reason that these are not linearly related to each other. When we look in eukaryotic cells, we see four ribosomal RNAs. We see a 5S, we see a 5.8S, a an 18S, and a 28S. And we'll see that the 28S and the 23S have similar functions. We'll see that the 18S and the uh, 16S have uh, similar uh, functions. And we'll see that the 5S of eukaryotes and the 5S of prokaryotes have similar functions. The 5.8S of eukaryotes has, a unique, has other unique functions that are not found in prokaryotes. I love this picture because this shows the structure um, of a ribosome, okay? And the ribosome is mostly comprised of RNA, all right? I mentioned in class earlier that the largest uh, macromolecules in cells are nucleic acids. And um, though a ribosome has 50 plus proteins within it, the vast majority of the weight comes from the large RNA molecules that are contained within them. And though at the time we didn't realize it when we first started studying ribosomes, the RNAs in ribosome, at least one of them, actually catalyzes a reaction. Okay? So a catalytic RNA is found in the ribosome. It's known as a ribozyme. A ribozyme is a catalytic RNA. The ribozyme that's found in ribosomes that catalyze the reaction actually catalyzes the formation of peptide bonds. So all peptide bonds that are made in cells are made as a result of action of a ribozyme. In prokaryotic cells, that ribozyme is found in the 23S ribosomal RNA. And in eukaryotic cells, the ribozyme function is found in the 28S uh, eukaryotic messenger, or, uh, ribosomal RNA. This shows uh, one of the uh, ribosomal RNAs, and you can see a lot of stem looping, okay? A lot of stem looping that's present uh, in these things. The structures of these um, appear to be very important because between organisms, we see variations in sequence, but where we see, for example, in an organism where that A becomes a G, we see that the corresponding base on the other side becomes a C, which tells us that the structure is important. Maintaining that base pairing is important. And the structure is held together by the proteins that bind to it. So the structure is important. The structure is more important than the sequence itself is. So long as the sequences can pair and form this structure, that's generally the most important consideration for ribosomal RNAs. And each one has their own specific structure. OK. Now, I've got about seven or eight minutes uh, to start talking about translation. And I do want to do that. So let's uh, turn our attention. Before I do that, I will ask if there are any questions. I'm doing a lot of talking, and you guys are very quiet. Questions? Everybody's at that time in the term where it's getting old, isn't it? 
Yes, question here. Well, I explain RNA editing one more time. Okay, so RNA editing is simply changing the identity of one base to another internal to an RNA. It happens in messenger RNAs, and it's happening under the direction of guide RNAs. So guide RNAs are RNAs that are complementary, for the most part, to a messenger RNA, and the places where they're non-complementary are the locations of where the editing must occur. And the editing is done so as to make them be complementary completely. Does that help? Okay. Translation. Okay. Translation is um, essential, obviously, because translation is the process whereby information encoded in messenger RNA is converted to a sequence of amino acids that make up proteins. Last term you learned the importance of the sequence of uh, amino acids and proteins, because if you change the sequence of amino acids and proteins, you change the function and the efficiency and all kinds of things about that protein. So the sequence of amino acids is absolutely critical. I showed you the central dogma um, when I started talking about transcription. I'll remind you that the central dogma tells you that DNA makes RNA, makes protein. And yes, there are some back and forth with DNA and RNA, but there's no back and forth between um, uh, protein and messenger RNA. Okay, we don't see backwards translation, for example. The process of translation occurs as, act as a result of action of ribosomes that read the sequence in messenger RNAs and cause amino acids to be joined together covalently to form peptide bonds. I mentioned when I talked about transcription that there were fundamental differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes due to the anatomical differences between them. Prokaryotes do not have a nucleus and so the DNA is in the cytoplasm, whereas Eukaryotes have a nucleus that is separate from the cytoplasm, and so the DNA is contained in the nucleus. Consequently, in eukaryotic cells, transcription occurs in the nucleus where the DNA is, but translation occurs out in the cytoplasm, and that means then that the messenger RNAs that are made in the nucleus must be transported out to the cytoplasm. And I talked about how the cap facilitated the movement of the messenger RNA out into the cytoplasm. In prokaryotic cells, we don't have that going on. Because we have everything in the cytoplasm in a prokaryotic cell, that means that translation can occur as transcription is going on. So once the five prime end of a messenger RNA starts to appear and there's region to be translated, the ribosomes will bind to it while transcription is actually occurring. That happens only in prokaryotic cells. A very, very important point, though. Okay. Prokaryotes have another feature that I haven't talked about, okay? And it's also different from eukaryotes. Prokaryotes are very efficient in their use of nucleic acid. They're very, very efficient, okay? You know they're very efficient when they replicate their DNA. I told you they were going at about 1,000 nucleotides a second in prokaryotes. Eukaryotes don't go nearly as fast as that. And I said they didn't have to. But the prokaryotic life cycle is very, very rapid turnover. They do things rapidly. And they don't waste space in their DNAs. We don't see introns, for example, in prokaryotic cells. Okay? All the introns are gone. People argue about, did the introns come first and then get removed and we ended up with prokaryotes? Or did we start with prokaryotes and then introns got put in? And there are people that argue that both ways. Okay? What we do know is that prokaryotes don't have introns, so therefore their DNAs are considerably smaller. Okay? And the, DNA, the, the genes are usually organized very carefully according to function, meaning that genes with similar function will commonly be adjacent to each other within the bacterial DNA. 
very commonly be adjacent to one another on a bacterial DNA. And that means that they can be transcribed, messenger RNA can be made, that contains on a single messenger RNA all of those related genes. This doesn't happen in eukaryotic cells. In eukaryotic cells, one messenger RNA, one gene. Prokaryotic cells, we can have one messenger RNA and we can have up to 10 genes on it. Okay? We can have up to 10 genes on it. Okay? This, um, um, this arrangement, okay, uh, is a, a term that we give to it is that these uh, genes are, 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 are uh, I can't say the word I want, are polycystronic, meaning that there are multiple genes on a given messenger RNA. Now this allows for efficiency as well. I'll talk later about the LAC operon. The LAC operon is an arrangement of genes in E. coli that code for the functions that allow a cell to metabolize the sugar lactose. And because of that, and because they're all made on the same messenger RNA, that when you control the synthesis of one, you control the synthesis of all because they're all on the same messenger RNA. So this allows efficiency, and because we don't have gaps between there, we see uh, between the individual genes of any significant note, we see efficient use of the nucleic acids to make uh, what we're after. Okay, I've gone through a lot of stuff there today, so I think I'll take a break there. I've got a short song that I like to call the Biochemistry National Anthem. And for it, the National Anthem, you need to stand and place your hand on your heart. So everybody please stand and place your hand on your heart. Yes, yes, yes. And we're going to sing this loudly. It's very easy. It's to the tune of America the Beautiful. I don't see people standing. Please stand and... There we go. All right. Oh, beautiful with RNA that makes the peptide bonds. You hold tRNA so it can pair up with codons. The ribosome, the ribosome, translate mRNA, initiate and translocate from start to UGA. All right, see you guys on Friday.